in this lecture we will address the question whether we live in an Euclidean space if our universe is Euclidean or is it something different in our previous lecture entitled is our space three-dimensional we discussed the dimensionality of our space and concluded that we live in a 3D space. We also spoke of the reasons of considering hidden dimensions, extra dimensions, 10 or 11 dimensions as suggested by string theory, their need and so on. In lecture IN1A namely coordinate system part 1 we started with the concepts of point, line or distance and angle based upon which Euclid proposed his geometry called Euclidean geometry. As the name implies, we will also in this lecture focus mainly on Euclid's work and we will discuss if in 300 BC he could visualize with his powerful thoughts and foresight with his exceptionally inventive eyes the structure of the universe. We will also do a very significant problem. Let us begin with a few words on Euclid's life. Though much of him is not known and there are many contradictory descriptions. Euclid was a famous Greek mathematician and he lived around 300 BC studied under Plato the legendary Greek philosopher. Euclid taught mathematics in Alexandria a historically eminent place of Egypt. Though much of his life is not known for certain Euclid who roamed the earth some 2000 years ago is remembered for his work, a 13 volume book entitled The Elements that is the most read book after Bible. This book contained a compilation of knowledge of geometry, principles of geometry and included works of great people like Pythagoras, Thales, Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates, and so on. The name Euclid in Greek means renowned and glorious and it goes without saying that Euclid who is called father of geometry could do justice to his name. Euclid's work The Elements contained statements, proofs and descriptions of things related to geometry and they were based upon five postulates. These form the basis of Euclid's geometry. And you know postulates are something we assume to be true and is the basis of further reasoning. We have so many postulates in physics also. So let us mention Euclid's postulates. For instance, the first postulate says that two points can be connected by a straight line and the second one says that we can extend a straight line. The third postulate says that from a point we can move out equal distances that is go radially outwards by an equal amount and then we get a circle of a given radius. The fourth postulate assumes that all right angles are equal and now comes the fifth postulate which actually is the key point of the topic today and will be referred to often. Not in Euclid's language but in simple language this postulate says that if there were two lines AB and CD such that alpha plus beta is less than 180 degrees then these lines AB and CD will meet that is will be non-parallel. For a student of physics these are easy things, obvious things. Let us state some alternate forms of this postulate. 
So these are the alternate statements of the fifth postulate of Euclid. In A we say that if line MN intersects another line AB then MN will also intersect another line CD that is parallel to AB. Now B says that if there is a line AB and there is a point P not on the line AB then we can draw only one line CD through P which is parallel to AB. In C the same thing has been said in the following fashion. Two polygons. Polygon means a plane figure with three or more straight sides and angles. So two polygons will be similar that is will resemble each other if their corresponding angles are equal and corresponding sides are proportional. In fact, one is the other's blow up variety or replica or one is the other's reduced version or replica. The last one, D, is a very common one which says that the sum of all the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. Now with these postulates which are obvious statements let us simply highlight that is re-mention the basic results that we use in physics when we say that we are resting on Euclidean geometry that is applying Euclidean geometry. Some has been mentioned in lecture IN1A which was coordinate system part 1. Anyway, let us mention the properties of Euclidean space now. Euclidean space is a region where Euclidean geometry holds, the postulates hold and the regions can be 1D or 2D or 3D and we can extend the idea to even n dimensions. The technique of extending two higher dimension was described in lecture IN1A where we introduced two extremely useful concepts or tools namely Einstein's summation convention and the Kronecker delta symbol. So Euclidean space is a flat space because this geometry is true in the flat space which is defined by the fact that if we draw two perpendiculars at any two points and extend them then these two lines will never meet as they are parallel. This is expressed by saying that the radius of curvature is infinity and the curvature is zero. If we draw a circle in a plane the flat surface and measure distance along circle we get what we call the circumference C. Now measure distance from the center to any point on the circumference that will give us the radius. Then the ratio of C to the radius R is 2 pi. So we have C is equal to 2 pi R as the length of the circumference. In Euclidean space that is in flat space the angles are coordinated in such a way that they all sum to 180 degrees. And in a right angle triangle, Pythagoras theorem holds, which is this one. Also, in Euclidean geometry, the rules of ordinary algebra, namely uh, these relations, hold, which tells us or defines how to handle numbers, what to do with them, how to use them. A point is defined by attaching coordinates to it which is an ordered combination of real numbers 1 in 1D, 2 in 2D, 3 in 3D and similarly in higher dimensional Euclidean space which is an abstraction not connected with the physical world but dealing with it might equip us with more insight and sharpness and increase our perception 
when we come to tackle actual physical problems of the physical world. Length invariance is what we spoke of at length in previous lecture IN1A, a very important property that you have to respect. Significantly, time has no role to play. In Euclidean space, we define vectors, we define dot product, we define cross product and we will take them up for discussions in lectures on vector calculus elaborately. Let us return to Euclidean space again. Euclidean space was described by a metric Kronecker delta ij. ds2 here is the distance square between two closely spaced points. ds2 is also called metric. Now ds2 can be written in this way. We did this in previous lecture IN1A and gij is the metric or metric tensor characterizing the space in general and it is identical to Kronecker delta in Euclidean space and this Kronecker delta ensures absence of cross terms and presence of only square terms which are added. Let me make one thing very clear by the term metric we often refer to distance square that is ds2 and in some other times by this term metric we refer to gij which is the metric tensor. So better concentrate on the symbols ds2 and gij which will make things clear and of course a long distance in space is actually a combination of tiny distances. So metric tells us everything. Now I feel that any science teacher should try to highlight or at least bring to the fore the challenges the people of science felt and how they overcame the challenges. Some did so through hard work, some through sheer brilliance. And so goes the stories that are not only interesting but also encouraging. A bit about such a young boy whose name was Janos Bolai of Hungary whose father was a renowned mathematician. Bolai was brilliant and mastered the intricacies of calculus at a tender age and subsequently was attracted to Euclid's fifth postulate. So Euclid's fifth postulate which is also called the parallel postulate comes into discussion again and it did numerous times for over 2000 years and there were reasons to do so. Now as mentioned the elements the book of Euclid where proofs and discussions were done contained five postulates out of which four postulates were simple, obvious and perceptible. But the fifth postulate was not so. The fifth postulate or the so-called parallel postulate was stated by Euclid not in a straightforward manner but in a convoluted kinky or twisted manner. It was not self-evident. It was such that without it you could not proceed. But again it was difficult to prove. Numerous mathematicians and the finest brains made terrific efforts but to no avail. Let me narrate a very exciting story of life the life of Boloi that was full of twists and turns like what we see in a thriller. Boloi was advised by his father based upon his experience, expertise, involvement and understanding of the parallel postulate. He wrote to his son Boloi in 1820 and I read it. 
you must not attempt this approach to parallels. I know this way to the very end. I have traversed this bottomless night which extinguished all light and joy in my life. I entreat you, leave the signs of parallels alone. Learn from my example. Clearly, father suggested to Bolai not to pursue this line of research. But Bolai, a smart and outstanding boy, spirited and energetic, ignored the advice of his father and continued with the mysterious parallel postulate. He was steadfast and with the brilliance that he had in his command, he could figure out the riddle, the puzzle. In 1832, Bolay wrote to his father, I have discovered such wonderful things that I was amazed. Out of nothing, I have created a strange new universe. Yes, Bolai discovered a geometry which is called non-Euclidean geometry. And now comes the first twist of the tale. As a student of physics, you know the name of Gauss. This name, somewhat like Newton's, is inscribed in majority of the pages of any book on physics. Now, as Gauss came across Bolloy's work that was published as an appendix to a math textbook written by his father, Gauss was puzzled and he wrote, I regard this young geometer, geometer is someone who studies geometry, as a genius of first order. To praise your work would amount to praising myself for it coincides with my own meditations for the past 30 to 35 years. Gauss, who was also called the foremost of mathematicians, did work on Euclid's fifth postulate and it is clear from this statement that the work of Gauss on Euclid's fifth postulate that he did over his life was reproduced by Bolai independently in a matter of three to four years. Bolai, in spite of writing a mathematical masterpiece, was thus robbed of the glory that he deserved to receive uniquely. He was greatly upset, became irritable and a difficult person to get on with. And indeed, Gauss was not lying, as evident from his earlier communications with his friend that mentioned the same work, though Bolloy had serious suspicions and doubts. The tale does not end here, and there is a further twist. Bolloy, who continued to develop mathematical theories, came to know later to his horror that a Russian mathematician Lobachevsky had already published the same work three years prior to him in 1829 and Bolai even doubted the existence of Lobachevsky and also he thought that all these were evil designs of Gauss. Currently all the three namely Gauss, Bolloy and Lobachevsky are credited with the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry. The sad part of the story is that Bolloy did not publish more than the few pages of the appendix but left over 20,000 pages of manuscript of brilliant mathematical works. Let me state in a jocular vein that it was the genius of Euclid's parallel postulate that made all the best brains to run parallel only to find that the parallel postulate was not always right. 
will mention it later. Now come to the first problem. We have to obtain the metric in 2D Euclidean space and show that it is actually the Kronecker delta symbol. And this is it. Actually, we did this in lecture IN1A. Here, we did not use the suffixes 1 and 2 for x and y, but continued with the coordinates x and y and the matrix representing the metric contains gxx which is the first row first column element similarly gxy is the first row second column element and so on the matrix structure being 1001 it is Kronecker delta and so it is a Euclidean metric the next problem is to show that in 2D Euclidean space we can have a non-Euclidean metric if we consider curvilinear coordinates. Look at this definition. A space is Euclidean if a coordinate system exists for which the metric is Kronecker delta at each location and this occurs for Cartesian coordinate system. But even in Euclidean space if we consider a coordinate system involving a distance rho and an angle phi then build the metric it is non-euclidean so we can have a non-euclidean metric in euclidean space now let us do the problem it is easy write down the transformation relation x is equal to rho cos phi and y is rho sin phi and apply the chain rule the variation in x is actually a collection of the variations in rho and phi and so we have this relation of vector calculus and similarly we have dy now evaluating the partial derivatives we get dx and dy in terms of d rho and d phi now put this in the metric ds2 to get d rho square plus rho square d phi square and see there are no cross terms because the variations are orthogonal so the metric is 1 0 0 rho square and importantly it is non-euclidean because it is not equal to Kronecker delta that is 1 0 0 1 form so it is a non-euclidean metric in a space which is Euclidean. Let us redo it through an easier process. Vary rho only, keeping phi constant. So if we move straight outwards radially, distance is ds equal to d rho. And if we vary phi only, keeping rho constant, we get this arc. Rho is the radius and d phi is the elemental angle needed to trace this arc. So the length of this arc is ds is rho d phi. Now since unit vectors along rho and phi, that is rho cap and phi cap are orthogonal, the variations are orthogonal too, and so we can add them up using Pythagoras theorem. So for orthogonal variations, we have this relation, which actually gives us the metric 1, 0, 0 rho square, which is not equal to the Kronecker delta, meaning that it is non-Euclidean metric though the space is Euclidean. Let us now do a problem that will take us very near to the question we started with namely is our space Euclidean. In problem 1 we are asked to write down the Euclidean metric in 3D space and the answer is simple one and here it is. So we can move on to the next question which asks to build the metric of a 2D spherical surface in 3D Euclidean space. Now note that Euclidean space in which Euclidean geometry holds is a flat space with zero curvature. Now the surface of a sphere is obviously curved and so Euclidean metric won't be able to describe things here and we have to have a new metric and we are asked 
in this problem to derive that metric. Let us start with a 2D coordinate system. This is x axis, this is y axis. A point in this plane is P having Cartesian coordinate xy and plane polar coordinates rho phi. This length OP is rho and this angle is phi which is measured in the anticlockwise sense from x axis. And the transformation relation between the Cartesian and plane polar coordinates is given by x equal to rho cos phi and y equal to rho sin phi. And the resultant of x and y is rho which is given by rho square equal to x square plus y square. Please see how the problem is tackled. This will help us a lot when we go to problem 3. Now what we do is we add a dimension say the z axis to this 2D plane which means we are introducing a new coordinate z to this 2D plane. So now the Cartesian coordinate becomes x, y, z. Accordingly the plane polar coordinates will also be extended by another coordinate which we take to be an angle theta with these limits. So we make extension from 2D to 3D in this way. The physical significance of theta and its limits will be discussed in lecture IN1D elaborately. Let us now study the effect of moving from 2D to 3D that is the effect of considering extra coordinates z and theta. Compare these two diagrams. In 2D the resultant of x and y was rho and in 3D the resultant of rho and z is r. So we move from the earlier resultant rho to the new resultant r. As per the technique theta is the angle between the new resultant r and the new coordinate z. So z is r cos theta and a rho is r sin theta and this new resultant r is connected to rho and z through this equation r square equal to rho square plus z square. We can find the metric ds2 in two ways. One is by brute force using differentiation and a bit of calculation as we shall do now. This is a rigorous way to get to the desired metric. This is the 2D result x equal to rho cos phi and y equal to rho sin phi. Using rho equal to r sin theta here we end up with these two relations for x and for y and z is r cos theta. So we have got the transformation relation. Now the set x, y, z and the set r theta phi define or characterize the same 3D space and they do it completely and unambiguously by themselves. So x depends upon r theta phi and so by chain rule we have this relation that is change in x dx is related to the changes in theta and phi and dr is absent in this relation because we are considering a spherical surface for a sphere r is constant so dr is zero del x del theta del x del phi are partial derivatives and on calculation we get this relation and similarly for dy we end up with this relation for dz we have this one by the same logic now the metric ds2 is dx square plus dy square plus dz square and if we put these relations correctly what we get is this one which on simplification gives this result for the metric or the distance square a look at this expression shows that there are no cross terms and we can expand it and write with the help of these metric tensor elements when these terms are clubbed we get this matrix which represents gij the metric tensor and obviously this is not equal to Kronecker delta meaning that it is a non-euclidean metric though the space is euclidean 
we can arrive at the same result a bit more easily as follows. Consider the coordinate system x, y, z. P is a point which has coordinate arc theta phi. A sphere is involved whose radius is smaller. It follows that this r is constant on spherical surface. If we vary theta only, that is keeping phi constant, then the distance traced is r d theta. r is the radius, pq is the r traced, and the elemental angle is d theta, so this is r d theta. So ds is r d theta. Again, if we vary phi only, keeping theta constant, then the r traced is this one, the radius being rho, and this elemental angle is d phi, and therefore the arc traced is rho d phi. So ds is rho d phi. And again, rho is r sin theta. So we have ds is equal to r sin theta d phi. Now the unit vectors along r cap, theta cap, phi cap are orthogonal, which means the variations of theta and phi are orthogonal. So for orthogonal variations, Pythagoras theorem can be applied and we can add them up to get the resultant variation and this gives the metric ds2 where we have taken r square common and this corresponds to as shown previously this matrix corresponding to the metric tensor gij which is not euclidean now come to question 3 we have to build a metric for 3d sphere surface in 4d euclidean space in question 2 we got the metric for 2D spherical surface in a 3D Euclidean space. So the first thing we have to do is to extend from 3D to 4D adhering to the same technique that was followed while we move from 2D to 3D. Refer to this 3D picture. What we do now is add a dimension, say omega axis, to the 3D plane by introducing a new coordinate omega. So the coordinate become 4 in number x, y, z and omega. And the spherical polar coordinate in 3D which was r theta phi have to be extended by another coordinate which we take to be angle psi. With this limit following the technique or strategy of extension in the earlier case. Now compare the two diagrams. In 3D, the resultant of x, y, z or equivalently z and rho was r. In 4D, the resultant of x, y, z, omega or equivalently resultant of r and omega is say capital R. So we move from our earlier resultant r to the new resultant capital R and psi is the angle between the new resultant capital R and the new coordinate omega and all these are as per the technique we followed previously. So omega is capital R cos psi and small r is capital R sin psi and the new resultant capital R is connected to r and omega through this relation. As definitions are over, it is time to derive the metric now and we will do it through the easier process by considering orthogonal variation of coordinates. Which coordinates? It would be theta phi and psi. As before, r will be taken constant, it being the radius. Now these were the previous transformation relations x, y, z and here r theta phi. The new transformation relations will be obtained from here by putting instead of r capital R sin psi and therefore this relation will be converted to this one instead of for y we would have instead of this relation this one for z r will be replaced by capital R sin psi so we have these relations and omega was capital R cos psi and here it is so these are the transformation relations. Now very shy, the distance traced will be r d shy. This is analogous to the result r d theta when we varied theta only, 
in the previous case and when we vary psi we keep theta and phi constant again if we vary theta and phi only that is we keep psi constant the result will be this one where of course r has to be replaced by capital R sine psi and therefore we have this result now these two variations are orthogonal and therefore we can combine them using Pythagoras theorem in this way and this leads to this very important result as was asked for in question 3 now this is a non Euclidean metric for 3D surface of a sphere in 4D Euclidean space and since a sphere is considered it is a closed surface so this corresponds to a closed surface now come to the fourth question we have to obtain a special metric which is the very famous Robertson Walker metric that attempts to describe the fabric of the universe we can obtain it without much trouble through simple substitutions in a 4D Euclidean space and we will not go into the logical side in details we will just mention the substitutions and get to the result so let us substitute u for sin psi and we can find du and therefore this gives d psi and when put back we end up with this relation you might have heard of general theory of relativity of Einstein and also about the fact that it is said space-time is curved and the cause is presence of matter in view of this we make this type of substitution we are not going to elaborate on this just note the substitutions in order to get to the final result so here a is called scale factor and k is the global curvature parameter so instead of capital R we will now have two important parameters coming into the theory and if these substitutions are made then we end up with this result and a final substitution of u by root k and call it small r and this small r is called the co-moving distance which is the relative distance between two observers both moving and therefore we end up with this metric which is called Robertson Walker metric now in this metric k is an important factor which decides the fate of the universe if k is greater than 0 that is k is positive then we have a closed universe a finite universe and if k is less than 0 that is k is negative then we have an open universe and the universe is infinite and if k is 0 we have a flat universe now move on to the final two questions Minkowski metric and Robertson Walker space-time metric the Minkowski metric is given by this relation and the details of which you will do in special theory of relativity class and one thing can be noted is we have this part here and to this Euclidean part we have added just minus c square dt square and this gives us a Minkowski metric so the effect of time has been incorporated and instead of length invariance therefore we will have invariance of four interval which is called ds2 details will be done in special theory of relativity class and in a similar way to the robertson walker metric we can add minus c square dt square and then we have this result for ds2 which is called robertson walker space time metric and we'll end this problem by stating that this robertson walker space time metric is a general metric and with it one can describe expanding homogeneous isotropic universe details are not needed in this lecture details you will do in class on cosmology let us now list down describe and interpret the key results to describe universe we need robertson walker metric we need einstein's field equation and we are not going into these stuff just mentioning them we also need certain assumptions to move on and let me state the assumptions because they are extremely easy 
The first assumption tells us to ignore the internal structures and regard universe to be containing a homogeneous cosmological fluid. And through this assumption, the bumpy, uneven, irregular structure can be done away with, can be smoothened out. Assumption 2 of while says that the various galaxies are moving according to their own path as time flows. The third assumption, which is a famous one known as cosmological principle, says that universe is homogeneous and isotropic. So the large scale structure appears same. And these two terms, homogeneous and isotropic, are terms that a physics student encounters very often in various models or theories. After analysis of all these and going through tough calculations, one can arrive at the fate of the universe. And there are three options which suggest that there are three types of fabric or texture or structure of universe. And let me present these three possibilities in a tabular form and mention them briefly. So here are the three options. If universe has a zero curvature, then the geometry will be Euclidean geometry, which is actually the geometry of flat surface. And a triangle in this flat surface, say drawn in this sheet as shown here, will contain three angles and when added we get 180 degrees. If universe has a positive curvature, then the geometry it satisfies will be called spherical or elliptic geometry and it is the geometry on a spherical surface and as shown in a 2D spherical surface, the three angles of a triangle add up to greater than 180 degrees. This can be straight away demonstrated if we look at this sphere where we have drawn three great circles all passing to the center. Now this is one great circle. This is another great circle which has been drawn in such a way that this angle is 90 degrees. We have drawn another great circle here which makes angle 90 degrees with this great circle as well as this one. So we have three great circles, one, two and three and they intersect at three points and at each point the angle is 90 degrees. So this is a triangle upon a sphere which contains three right angles. So the sum of these angles is 270 degrees. And we have so many such triangles. This is one triangle, this is another triangle here, this is another triangle, this is another one and also we have so many triangles drawn. We have shown here the three right angles. If universe has negative curvature, then the geometry it satisfies will be hyperbolic geometry and it will be geometry of a saddle shaped or trumpet cone surface, somewhat like this. And here, if we draw a triangle, this triangle will contain three angles, some of which is less than 180 degrees. The saddle surface will be like this. As space-time expands with time, these triangles get bigger and bigger. If universe is of zero curvature, then in a flat surface, for instance in this sheet, the relation between circumference of a circle and radius of a circle will be c is equal to 2 pi r. But if curvature is positive, then this relation will be different. The circumference will be less than 2 pi r. If we draw a circle on the sphere of radius r on the surface and if we take a section by a plane, then in the plane the radius of the circle will be capital R. So this small r is the radius on the surface and this capital R is radius on the plane. And obviously capital R is less than small r. So if we multiply by 2 pi we have 2 pi r less than 2 pi smaller and this 2 pi r is by definition the circumference so circumference is less than 2 pi r while 
for negative curvature the circumference will exceed 2 pi r a flat surface obviously as the name implies has infinite radius of curvature for zero curvature case space is infinite in all directions and this is called critical universe while for positive curvature case space is finite and we call it a closed universe if someone starts journey from this point say then after moving along the great circle he or she will come back to the initial point so the concept of closed universe is clear and for negative curvature universe is infinite in all directions and we will call it an open universe in the case of zero curvature if we draw a line and then if we draw perpendiculars to those lines on the surface and extend them then they will never meet because the lines are parallel and this is what happens in a flat space but in the positive curvature case if we similarly take a line and then draw perpendiculars then these perpendiculars will meet because they are convergent lines in this case space is said to be contracted between lines we can show it easily consider this great circle and these are perpendicular lines on the great circle and then these lines when extended they meet at this point which we may take to be the north pole so these are convergent lines but in case of surface having negative curvature if we take a line and draw perpendiculars then they are divergent and so no question of them coming together so here space is stretched between lines for zero curvature case it is said that there is enough mass to cause expansion to stop but such stoppage will occur after lapse of infinite period of time in this case universe has no bounds and will expand forever this is the euclidean universe or flat universe but if universe had a positive curvature then amount of mass is sufficient to stop the present expansion universe is not infinity but has an end so the expansion will stop eventually and contraction will set in galaxies which are moving away from each other now will ultimately come closer and universe will collapse on itself it is a closed universe in the negative curvature case mass is insufficient and so expansion will go on forever if this happens we will call it an open universe finally for zero curvature case if we have a line ab and a point p not on the line then only one parallel line cd can be drawn through the point p but for positive curvature case we cannot draw any line parallel but in case of negative curvature there will be infinite number of parallel lines this is what happens to euclid's fifth postulate so these geometries are non euclidean while this one is euclidean we are not going into all these things in details these are being stated for comparison purpose so with these calculations predictions observations lying in the backdrop in our discussion we mentioned multiple times that in a flat space the three angles of triangle when summed gives 180 degrees let us set out now to address the query is our space euclidean and if it is not a flat space we would get either greater than 180 degree for positive curvature case or less than 180 degree for negative curvature case now between 1818 to 1832 gauss performed an experiment he chose three widely spaced mountain tops at mutual distances of 53 miles 123 miles and 43 miles and used instruments like sextant mirror etc and employed the phenomena of reflection of solar light only to find that the three angles of the triangle formed with mountain tops as the vertices when summed gives 180 degrees of course within limits of experimental error 
this suggests a Euclidean or flat universe. Let us speak of another series of experiments and collection of data relating to CMBR that is cosmic microwave background radiation which is the radiation that is still present the radiation which was emitted during Big Bang so it is also called relic radiation we won't go into these things in this lecture but talk about measurements of curvature from the data given by the WMAP or Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe between the years 2001 and 2010 that gave a curvature which is slightly negative. So universe is nearly Euclidean, nearly flat. This we can take to be the answer though there are several associated things that are needed to be discussed and that are talked about in cosmology. But today we will stop here and this is our conclusion. Let me end with a reference to Euclid's The Elements. The then king of Alexandria asked, Is there a shorter path to learning geometry than Euclid's The Elements? Euclid replied, There is no royal road to geometry. Learning physics needs sincerity and devotion and of course certain amount of sharpness but does not depend on whether you are rich or poor whether you have a royal descent or you are having an ignoble or humble origin thank you